Beautifully done, and congratulations, graduates. 49 years ago this week, I got my first degree from here in MDiv. And so as you celebrate today and you celebrate with all your family and friends who are filling this building today, there's another group of folks that are celebrating with you. And that's this incredible faculty, these men and women who've poured their lives into you. They celebrate. You're the fruit of their labor. And I'll tell you this, you'll take them with you the rest of your life. Most of the professors I had here in the MDiv program are in heaven today, but they've lived on in my heart every day of the ministry that I've received from the Lord. You know, the best of all the commencement speeches are short. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> Many of you may have heard after World War II, Yale was giving Sir Winston Churchill an honorary degree after the war. And he came to New Haven to receive it and to be the commencement speaker at their graduation. And they were also honoring a, an elderly man, a, a Yale alumnus who was a huge donor to the school who spoke right before Churchill. And he got up and he spoke and he thanked them and he talked about what it meant. And then he went into uh, an initialism, an acronym. He said, why? He said, why is for youth? And he talked about the importance of youth and how youth energized. He went on for 10 minutes talking about that. Then he said, A, A is for academics. And he talked about how that was what Yale was known for and how they were such academic uh, such an academic institution and what these young people had gotten from there. It went on for another 10 or 12 minutes. L, he said, is for loyalty. And he talked about how they needed to go from that place and be loyal to their alma mater as donors and supporters of the school and went on another 10 minutes. Then he got to E and he said, excellence. <clears throat> and he talked about excellence. After 45 minutes, he sat down. Whereupon Churchill came to the platform and the first words he said was, he said, I suppose we should all pause and pray and thank God that the previous speaker was not a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> so, we, we want to be short and to the point. In just a moment, you're going to walk across this stage and receive a diploma that's well earned through a lot of hard work and prayer and sacrifice. It's a defining moment in your life. It's a milestone in your life. And there's a sense in which the children of Israel did the same thing. After their education and their schooling in the wilderness, they too came to a place where they were to cross the Jordan into their own promised land to which God had promised them. And as they were about to go. Moses left them some final words. Among them are those recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. When he asked this question, he said, you know, I, I, you're about to go into the land of promise. All these years we've been planning and preparing to go in. And then he asked this question. Now that you're about to go, what does the Lord require of you? Now, you graduates, you know a lot about what these professors have required of you. Master's thesis, dissertations, oral comps, defending dissertations, tests of all kind, research papers. There's been a lot that has been required of you to come to this place to receive this diploma today. Now, as you go, the question for you is not what do these professors require of you anymore? The question is the same that was asked of the children of Israel when they were about to launch out into their calling. Deuteronomy 10, 12. What does the Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God? To fear the Lord your God. To walk in all his ways to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. What does the Lord require of you but to fear 
the Lord your God. If there was a common thread that's woven through the, the lives of every man and woman in the Bible that was used of God, that had the power of God, the anointing of God, whatever terminology you want to use, it was the fact that in one way or another it was said of all of them that they were walking in the fear of God. They realized that that's what the Lord required of them. All those Old Testament people. Noah, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, Noah by fear built the ark. The Hebrew midwives in Exodus 1, it says they feared God more than they did Pharaoh. Moses, here in his last words to the people of Israel, fear the Lord. Joshua took them in dry shod and, and he went through and conquered the promised land. At the end of his life in chapter 24, verse 14, he gives them a parting word. And what does he say? Now then, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Isaiah in chapter 50, verse 10, ask a question. Is there any among you anymore who fears the Lord? A week from Sunday is Mother's Day. Pastors all over the country are going to pray that Proverbs 31 woman out. <laughs> oh, she's perfect. <clears throat> Most of the moms are so guilty by the time they get to lunch with their family, they don't know what to do. But if you want to know the secret of her life, read far enough down in chapter 31 till you come to verse 30. And it says, a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Turn your Bible into the New Testament. It's all through the Gospels. In Luke 1, we're introduced to a young teenage virgin girl with the Christ alive and growing in her womb. Think about that. And she sings a song we call the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And she goes on in that song in verse 50 to sing, His mercy is on those who fear Him. Same chapter, Zacharias lost his speech. He got it back and the Bible says, fear fell upon all of them. In Luke 5, Jesus heals a paralytic and verse 26 says, they were all amazed and filled with fear. In Luke 7, he passes through a village called Nain and, and heals a little dead boy. Rise, he raises him from the dead. And the Bible says in verse 16, fear fell upon all of them in the village of Nain and the name of Jesus Christ was multiplied. We turn our Bibles into the book of Acts, the dynamic story, the Acts of the Holy Spirit in the early church. It's on every page. In Acts 2, Peter preaches the great Pentecostal sermon. And what does verse 43 say? Fear fell upon all of them. And many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. In Acts 5, there's a couple causing dissension in the church, lying to the church, worse, lying to the Holy Ghost, and God struck them dead. And verse 11 says, great fear came upon all the church. Last week, I stood in Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast in Israel. It was there that, that Peter took the gospel to the first Gentile convert, Cornelius. And what did he say in Acts 10 when he got to him? He said, whoever fears God and works righteousness will be accepted by him. We turn our Bibles into the epistles. It's all through the epistles. In Romans 3 verse 18, Paul laments of people who have no fear of God before their eyes anymore. In, in Romans eleven twenty, 20, he says, stand by faith. Don't be haughty, but fear the Lord. To the Corinthians, he says, let's perfect holiness in our lives. They ask how. And in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, he says, by walking in the fear of the Lord. To the Ephesians, he says, submit yourselves one to another. How? In the fear of the Lord. It's laced all through the scriptures. What does the Lord require of you? And finally, we get to the last book of the Bible, the Apocalypse, the Revelation. And in chapter 19, that beautiful picture of all the redeemed of all the ages, praising God, every tongue, nation, tribe, people. And then verse 5 says, a loud voice comes from the throne. And that voice says, praise our God, all you servants who fear him, both great and small. What does the Lord require of you? What does it mean to fear the Lord? Does it mean you have to walk around on eggshells afraid that if you do something wrong or say something wrong, he has some big club of retribution and he's gonna, something bad's going to happen to you or your family? No. The most common Old Testament word means to stand in awe before him with reverence and respect. 
The New Testament word is so akin to it. This reverential awe that you have before the Lord Jesus Christ who took your sin, who was died on the cross for your sin, was buried, who rose again on the third day, the gospel. It's to stand before him with this reverential awe, so much so that it becomes a controlling motivation of your life. It's not the fear that he's going to do something bad to you. I had a pastor, W. Fred Swank. He pastored 43 years, Sagamore Hill Baptist Church. In the decade of the 60s, 100 of us who were young people in that church went into gospel ministry. Almost all of them came here to Southwestern. Fred Swank taught me as a young man, just saved, what it meant to walk in the fear of God. He taught me that the fear of God was not the fear that God was going to put his hand of retribution on me, but it was the fear that God might take his hand of blessing or anointing off of me. That's what we're talking about. What does the Lord require of you? To live your life in such a fashion and in such an environment of the fear of the Lord that you don't want God to remove his hand of blessing, his hand of anointing from your life. What will happen as you go out into ministry now? What will happen if you begin to live in that environment that you don't want God to remove his hand? It'll make a difference in where you go, what you watch, what you say about people, what you do. You're going to go out in ministry and you're going to be faced with all kinds of temptations. When you walk in the fear of the Lord, God will give you a supernatural ability to overcome your sinful desires. We're living in a world today where more and more people are falling in ministry. Start walking in the fear of God. It's what he requires of you. And he'll give you a supernatural ability to overcome your sinful desires. Where do we get that? Proverbs 16, 6. It says, by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Did you hear that? What about Moses at Sinai, Exodus 20, 20? God has come to test you, to see what is in your heart, that his fear might be upon you so that you might not sin. He'll give you supernatural ability to escape and make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You know, when you go out in ministry, you're gonna need wisdom. There's a difference in knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Almost anybody can acquire knowledge if they stay in the library long enough. Wisdom is the ability to take those facts that you've put into your life now and go out in ministry and make wise decisions in what to do and when to do it and how to do it. How many times in Proverbs do we read that the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning. There is no wisdom. Unless you're, not, unless you're walking in the fear of God. It's the beginning of wisdom. Many of you are going to go out to preach the gospel. How you need God's spirit to illumine the word to you. Listen to what Psalm 25, 14 said. The psalmist said, the secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him. And to them, he'll reveal his covenant. You start walking in the fear of God that you don't want God to take his hand of blessing and anointing. You'll be shocked and amazed at what it will do to your study. And some of you are going to need deliverance when you go out there. Some of you are going to go into churches that are demon possessed. Some of you are going to go into churches that are deacon possessed. (laughs) And you're you're going to need deliverance. And in our scripture reading just a moment ago, we read from Psalm 34. Verse four, the angel of the Lord encamps among those who fear him and delivers them. What does the Lord require of you but to fear him as you go? Proverbs two, my son, if you receive my words, you've done that here at this school. And Treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. And if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver, search for it like hidden treasure, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord. It's a learned behavior that you get from the word of the living God. 
Let me just close by saying Solomon is purported to be the wisest man who ever lived. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes to tell us about the folly of all those things we think are so important in life, laughter and luxury and lust and all those things. It comes to the end of the book in chapter 12, verse 13. And he says, now then, hear the conclusion of the whole matter. That ought to make us perk our ears up. Now then, he said, hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. That's it. That's the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You say, preacher, I want the hand of God on me. Friend, it was the hand of God that brought you to Southwestern. It's the hand of God that's seen you through these years of toil and struggle and study. And it's the hand of God that will go with you when you leave this platform to your place of service, wherever it may be, all over the earth. So as you go, what does the Lord require? No longer what do these professors require. What does the Lord require? of you, but to fear him as you go. And may God's spirit go before you and bless you and make you a blessing to a world that's in desperate need of the gospel of Christ. God bless.